about 12 years ago now, I was on my way back from vacation, stopped at a store in Tennessee. It was the largest pocket knife store in the country. So they claimed. I didn't actually check that claim, but they did have thousands upon thousands of knives there. And I walked away with this little gem. So like 30,000 knives, this is the one that I wanted. Okay, One, because it's small and I could easily put it in my pocket. Two, it's really durable. I've washed it about 10,000 times because I forgot that it was in my pocket and it made its way through the washer. Three, it was only like $10. Excellent. And then four, there are only five tools on this thing and I have a use for every single one of them and I know how to use every single one of them. So like there's a little toothpick here which comes in handy at different times. Tweezers which has come in handy a ton. There's an actual knife which is good because it's a pocket knife. There's a little file with a uh, flathead screwdriver on the end, and then probably the most useful is a little pair of scissors, which I've used numerous times. Now, not only did I buy one for myself in red, because it's got to be red, it's a little Swiss Army knife, but then I also bought my wife a matching one in pink, because I'm just a considerate guy. Now, here's the thing about it, is that in this pocket knife store, thousands upon thousands of knives, and they had some that had like 30 plus attachments on them. And I thought to myself, I'd have to carry like a separate bag just to put this pocket knife in. We're getting pretty loose with the term pocket knife because it wouldn't fit in my pocket. And I was looking through all the attachments and I'm like, I don't even know what use I would have for half of these. And a third of them, I don't even know what it's supposed to be. I don't even know what I would use this thing for. Because whenever you buy a tool, whether it's on a pocket knife or otherwise, or you're given a tool maybe from somebody, if you don't know how to use it, it is of no good to you. So you can have all the tools in the world, but if you don't know what to do with the tools that you have, they just sit there neatly organized in your garage or your barn or whatever. A tool is only effective if you know how to use it. Well, today, as we continue our series, Untapped Potential, we're not necessarily talking about tools, but we are talking about spiritual gifts. Untapped Potential is all about the way that God lives inside of us and what that does in our lives and how that's a benefit and a blessing to us. And last week, we kind of launched a conversation about spiritual gifts. And here's what I would say about the spiritual gift conversation. If you have a spiritual gift, but you don't know what to do with it, or you don't know how to properly define the gifts and understand them, they are of no use to you. Having a tool, but not knowing how to use it, the tool's useless. Having a gift, but not knowing how to use it, the gift is useless. Last week we talked about 1 Corinthians 12. Today we're going to jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we're going to be discussing really one, and, and technically two gifts, but really Paul focuses in on one spiritual gift, And it's one that I think that oftentimes we misdefine and that we misuse. And when I say we, I just mean the church in the American context. We're going to talk today about the spiritual gift of tongues. Now many people, when you say that, they're all different types of thoughts and things that come into your mind because you maybe grew up in a certain type of church or taught a certain thing and some people are like anti gift of tongues. Some people are so oriented towards the gift of tongues that they've been told, as I have been told in my life, that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not really a Christian and you're not really saved. And then there's everybody in between. But just like the miraculous spiritual gifts or the gifts of power, it's like, don't, you know, don't think about it, don't talk about it, maybe it'll just go away. With the gift of tongues, I think sometimes we get it wrong and we misidentify the blessings and benefits of the gift, and when we misdefine it and when we use the tool in the wrong way, it's really no benefit to us. Let me say a few things as we jump in. Number one, we have to approach this with humility. So I am acknowledging to you as we walk through 1 Corinthians 14 and then a couple of other passages as well that I could be wrong in my understanding of the gift of tongues. That's a very real possibility because I've been wrong 17 times today already. So I could be wrong on this, okay? Number two, you could be wrong in your understanding of the gifts. And so if we're not on the same page, I could be wrong, 
you could be wrong. If you think that I'm wrong, you have to be able to show me book, chapter, verse, or how I mishandled the passages that we're covering today. If you say, well, I was always taught, or I've had an experience, or I've always thought, that doesn't help me. I can't argue against an experience. We can only go to the scripture and unpack it and say, here's our understanding of it. Number three, this is a much bigger conversation than a 30-minute message. And so what I don't want to do is like cover 1 Corinthians 14 and like the eight or, or, or so verses that we're going to cover and say, okay, that closes the matter. Now we're all on the same page. Let's just move on from this. Like this is the most controversial, I think, of all the spiritual gifts. It's why Paul specifically writes about it in 1 Corinthians 14. And so I think that you know, just one conversation isn't going to be enough about it. I think there are numerous that have to take place. And my goal is that we properly understand not just this one, but really big picture all the spiritual gifts so they could be tools that we use to help grow closer to God ourselves and help bring others into a closer or deeper relationship with Him as well. So 1 Corinthians 14, here's how the Apostle Paul begins. <clears throat> he says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit or eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Now let me push pause just real quick before we really even get into anything. Have you found yourself eagerly desiring spiritual gifts? Praying for different spiritual gifts, different opportunities, asking God to fill you in different ways so that you can bring glory to His name and bring people into a deep relationship with Him. Like Paul tells the church in Corinth, eagerly desire them, want them, ask for them. And if you don't have that mindset... If you're not asking for gifts and you don't eagerly desire them, I wonder what God will do in your life in terms of actually dispensing the spiritual gifts to you and making them real and tangible and teaching you how to use them. So the first thing we got to do is eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. And then he says, especially prophecy, which once again is not as much predicting future events, but speaking to people on behalf of God and showing them this is where you're wrong and this is how you need to get right. But he contrasts in this passage the gift of prophecy and the gift of tongues. Here's what he says in verse 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to the people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So when you prophesy, you're speaking intelligible words that people understand. But when you speak in a tongue... People do not understand what you're saying. And so there's less of a benefit whenever you speak in a tongue because people are sitting there going, well, that was cool, but what am I supposed to do with that? Whereas prophecy, there is clear, direct intention and clarity as to what a person's supposed to do with prophecy. Now he goes on. He says, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. The reason, once again, when someone prophesies, you know what you're supposed to do with that message? If someone speaks in a tongue, unless there's an interpreter, we don't know what's going on or what's being said. How are we supposed to say amen? How are we supposed to agree with you? And so Paul is saying, and he goes on to say, I would rather you speak five words that people understand than 10,000 words that nobody understands. Because prophesy or prophesying trumps the gift of tongues. Now when we start thinking about the gift of tongues, and certainly as Paul kind of walks through this passage, he talks about uttering mysteries in the spirit and that there's ambiguity as to what is being said but whenever we start to really look at the gift, the tool that God gives us to use, it seems that the words being said are not understood, but only by a certain audience. The gift of tongues isn't just that God understands what's going on, but there's a group of people that understand what's going on, but they're just not in the room. Let me go a little bit further in 1 Corinthians 14. Let's jump down to verse 22. Here's what Paul says. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. So when you gather together for church, you're going to have non-believers in your midst, 
but primarily you're going to have Christians that show up to your church service. Like, if we were to take a poll, we're not going to do that, by the way, but if we were to take a poll, like, how many of you are a Christian? I would just imagine that at least 51% of people would go, yes, I follow Jesus. In fact, it's probably closer to like 90%. And so Paul's trying to make a distinction. I would rather you use the gift of tongues when, or a, a prophesy when, in church. Because tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Now then he goes on to say, and just keep going with me here, he goes on to say in verse 23, so if the whole church comes together, as we are right now, and everyone speaks in tongues, don't do that yet, and inquirers or unbelievers come in, non-Jesus followers come into the church, everybody speaking in tongues, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Like if they walk in right now and we are all speaking in tongues, they're going to stop go, what is going on right now? I think we could still make somebody else's church service. Let's just try to sneak out and go to one of those other churches in the area because there are like literally hundreds within driving distance. Now, just think about this though. So if everybody speaks in tongue and a non-believer walks in, they're going to go, you're out of your mind. But look at what he says in verse 22. Tongues are a sign for non-believers. Okay, now wait a minute. So tongues are supposed to be used... In the presence of non-believers, and Paul says, if everybody's speaking in a tongue when you gather for church and a non-believer walks in, they're going to think you're out of your mind. How are both of those things true? Do you see the tension there? He says, tongues are a sign for non-believers. But with, when you gather for church and you're all speaking in tongues, if a non-believer walks in, they're going to think you're crazy. Now, wait a minute. I, you just said, Paul, that tongues are a sign for non-believers... And if we use them right now, and, and a non-believer walks in, he's going to think you're crazy. I thought it was a sign for him or her. I thought it was a sign for them. Why would they think we're crazy if we're using it when they walk in? Well, it's because I think we misdefine what the gift of tongues actually is. See, we define the gift of tongues as what people a lot smarter than me have called ecstatic utterance, which is to say... There are a string of syllables and sounds that get thrown together, thrown together that do not sound like anything coherent, but that's God kind of giving you the ability to speak a heavenly unknown language for the purpose of like, getting a special connection with Him. And so we just assume that tongues is just what we would call gibberish, but it's a super spiritual experience. But when tongues shows up for the very first time, in Acts chapter 2, it is not gibberish. It's a language or a collection of languages that people are able to understand. So Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the first time the gift of tongues actually shows up, which is a great place to go if you're trying to figure out what the gift of tongues is all about. Acts chapter 2, I want to read just a few verses to you. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, so remember, Jesus is gone, Holy Spirit has not come yet, all the believers are gathering together, praying together, worshiping with one another. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated out and came to rest on each of them, each of them being the, the apostles. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It's not just gibberish, though. It's understood. Verse 5 says, Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. So it wasn't just gibberish and a random collection of syllables. It was actually known languages that these people who were celebrating a, a big Jewish festival from all over the known world were coming, and they heard this sound and like a tornado-type wind, and they are like checking things out, and they can all hear the message preached not only in their own language, but in their own dialect as well. And it says that they were amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? How are these Galileans able to speak in our native tongue and in our dialect. 
And then I think there's a really interesting statement made in verse 13. So you have all these people, thousands. Remember, 3,000 got baptized on the day of Pentecost. So there are thousands listening going, how are we able to hear in our own language? What does this mean? But there was a small fraction of people. How many? It doesn't say. But there were a group of people there that made fun of the disciples, and they said they've had too much wine. Dudes are drunk. I mean, just listen to what's coming out of their mouths. Now, here's the thing about drunkenness. I'm told, okay? You're like, Phew, okay, good. Whenever you hear a drunk person communicate, it does not become more coherent, and they don't enunciate well, and their syllabification is off, is it not? I don't even know if that's a word. I just made it up. But you don't listen to a drunk person and go, my goodness, does this dude have his PhD in like oratory? What, what, how is he able to communicate? No, there's slurring of the words, which means, I think, that for whatever reason, a certain pocket of people there did not hear like a really clear their language coming in their dialect, they heard jibber-jabber. They heard a random collection of syllables. Now, why did they hear that and not everybody? And why weren't they included in hearing in their own dialect and language as well? I have no idea. But Peter actually gets up and kind of defends. He says, look, we're not drunk. It's only 9 in the morning. And he goes through to say, this is what's happening right now. So it seems, it seems that the ability to speak in tongues is the ability to speak in a known language for the purpose of evangelism. The reason the Apostle Paul says, if you all are speaking in tongues when somebody walks in, they're going to think you're crazy. Well, it's a sign for them, isn't it, Paul? Yeah, but think about our context. What language do we speak? Yep, we don't speak, apparently. Good for us. English, we speak English. I was waiting for someone to go, American. Yeah, we have our own dialect, right? Southern Illinois. And if we start speaking in tongues, if somebody speaks in German and Bosnian and Russian and Chinese, and like if we start speaking other languages and somebody walks in, they're going to think we're crazy. Why? Because they speak English. And even a non-believer, hey, the gift of tongues is for non-believers, but they're not going to understand what's going on. And they're going to walk out a lot faster than they walked in. But if you are in an environment where there's a language barrier and you want to share the gospel with an individual or with a group, the gift of tongues gives you the ability to speak in their language with no barriers. In their dialect, with their type of accent, it breaks down. And then they're able to see some person that's from the Midwest in America being able to speak in their language the way that they speak it. Now, I told you last week that I've prayed for the gift of tongues. And I prayed, like, God, I, whatever it looks like. And once again, I could be wrong. It could just be a static utterances. It could just be a random, unknown spiritual language. But it wasn't in Acts 2 when it showed up the very first time. And Paul says it's not a sign for believers. It's really not even to be used in the context of church. Really, it's supposed to be used outside the church. I mean, it all fits together to me. So I prayed for the gift of tongues, and here's why. Because... The eight years that I lived in St. Louis before coming back home, there was a heavy Bosnian population. The South County and St. Louis were just a lot of Bosnians. The guy who um, cleaned our church, his name was Eldon. He was Bosnian, spoke very broken English. When I would go to the rec center to play basketball, I would get in games, and all the, all the guys were Bosnian. And I thought, Lord, what an opportunity. If I could speak Bosnian to these guys and tell them about your love for them, like, break down the language barrier. Give me the gift of tongues that I might preach your gospel to them. And, of course, they knew I was a pastor, and I invited them to church. But imagine, imagine if in that moment I was able to just, and I can't even pretend to speak Bosnian, but I just, Bosnian came out, and they would go, what in the world? How are you able to speak in our native tongue? And I would be able to say to them, well, God loves you more than you could ever imagine. And he wants me to tell you about his son Jesus and how to enter a relationship with him. There'd be power in that. Tongues in that situation would be a sign for 
the non-believers that God sent me to communicate to them. Now, if I speak Bosnian right now, you guys would maybe be impressed. Like, wow, he could speak languages, good for him. But you would walk out going, he talked for 30 minutes, he preached a sermon, but it was all in Bosnian, I have no idea. It does not work here. Does that all make sense? Connect the dots as to how this all fits together? Now, once again, I could be wrong, but this makes really good sense to me when you piece everything together. And there are churches and movements that elevate the gift of tongues. Like, you're not saved unless you have the gift of tongues. But here's the problem with that. It's so easily faked. Like, let me give you a story. This is my, one of my best friends. We met in college. He told me a story about in Georgia. That's where he's from. He was really sweet on a girl. She invited him to youth group. You know, a young boy, he'll do anything for love. So he's like, yeah, I'll go to your youth group with you. He says at one point, they circled us up, and the youth leader went around and put his hands on every teenage kid and prayed that they would have the gift of tongues, and every kid started rocking and, you know, like ecstatic utterances coming out, unintelligible words, just syllables running together. And he's like, as they keep coming closer to him, he's like, what am I going to do? He broke out in a cold sweat. And so they put, it, they put hands on him, and they prayed, and he's like, dude, I just faked it. I started rocking, and I was making all kinds of noises, and I was like, I got to get out of here, but I don't, I don't want her to, you know, I'm just going to see what that happens. And they all jumped up, and they started celebrating, and they hugged him, and they were so thankful that he had gotten the gift of tongues. And he's like, oh, yeah, praise Jesus, as he was going out the door. They all thought he had it, and he just faked it. And so, like, the gift of tongues, Paul says, that's, like, down on the list. Like, when you're in church, you use the gift of tongues. It is a spiritual gift, but I would rather you guys prophesy, because then you can tell one another what God wants you to do and how God wants you to live. And get the gift of tongues, that was never meant to be the marker to identify who is a real Christian and who is not. Do you know what Jesus sets apart as this is the identifying marker this is how all men will know you're my disciples. Do you know what he said? Keep my commandments, love one another. Yeah. So they'll know you're my disciples if you love one another. Because love is kind of a big deal. And love, the agape, the selfless, sacrificial kind of love that Jesus is talking about is not so easily faked. You can't pretend because now you're talking about instead of a moment where syllables come out of your mouth, you're talking about a lifetime of doing your best to deny yourself, take up your cross, follow after him, and to look after the needs of others and not just the needs of yourself. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, which we covered, in the middle you've got 13. And most people know what 1 Corinthians 13 is all about. It's the love chapter. And, and this passage is read, like every wedding I do, I read verses 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. Because that's what love is supposed to look like in general, but it's definitely got to be present within the context of marriage. But the Apostle Paul, in the first three verses, he discusses, hey, listen, I've talked about spiritual gifts. I'm going to talk about them again in just a minute. But let me just push pause to let you know, like, the most important thing when we talk about life in general, but also when we discuss the spiritual gifts, it's got to be love. Everything has to be glued together with love. In fact, Paul says this in the first three verses. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Psh, psh, psh. You've heard of cymbals, right? Can you imagine talking to somebody and them going, oh yeah, psh, psh, and trying to talk to you? How long would that conversation last? I know how annoying symbols can be. You remember last week I told you I was in the band and that's what they gave me to play. And I would get looks from people because that's uh, symbols were annoying. Yeah, a, a, a resounding gong or a clanging symbol is just like, it's almost like nails on a chalkboard. You hear it long enough and it's loud enough, you just want to get out of there. Paul says, you can speak in any tongue on planet earth, but if you don't have love, you're just a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries, and you know everything, basically is what he's saying. If you know everything there is to be known, and on top of that, you have a faith that can move mountains. You can say to that mountain, 
Um, go over there. And poof, there it goes. So you know everything and you have a faith that can move mountains. You're kind of a big deal. But he says, if you don't have love, you're nothing. Like if somebody walked in here and was like, hey, just FYI, I know everything there is to know. And then we tested it. We got Wikipedia out and we started asking questions and boom, he's able to answer all these things. And then he goes, also, do you guys want to see something really cool? And he picked up the drum set with his Jedi powers and threw them on some other side of the room. We would go, oh my goodness, this is insane. But Paul says, if you're able to do all that and you don't have love, you may think you're all that in a bag of chips and you may see people do really cool things and go, oh my goodness, but if they don't have love, nothing. And if I, if I give all I possess to the poor, give everything I have away, and I surrender my body to hardship that I might boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Like what Paul says here is that you can take all the spiritual gifts and all the great things you're able to accomplish for the glory of God and the benefit of his church and the different ways that we bless one another and the different ways that the gifts are given for the common good that if you have all of this and if you had all the spiritual gifts we talked about how everybody has at least one gift let's say you had all the spiritual gifts but you don't have love none of it matters and none of it works love trumps everything love is by far the most important quality of a Christian and whether you have one, gifts, one gift or you have 50 gifts, none of it matters if you do not have love as your ultimate compass and your ultimate guide and direction on how you're supposed to use those gifts, how you're supposed to help people, and how you're supposed to glorify God. Love has to be present or none of it matters. And so Paul says to eagerly desire the spiritual gifts. To want those gifts, not to make yourself great or to look really good, so that you can bring glory to God and benefit the church. But before you eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, my challenge to you is grow in your relationship with Jesus and be filled with the Spirit so that love is the ultimate um, quality that is present in your life. Don't worry about the gifts until you start to passionately pursue agape love in your life and living that out. Not only in the church, but also outside the church as well. And I've often wondered, and I don't, like, I don't want to get too deep into different conversations and like, chase every rabbit trail, but I've often wondered, <clears throat> why wouldn't God give me the ability to speak Bosnian to share faith with these guys. Well, God's God. He's smarter than I am. He gets to make decisions without checking with me first. He's going to always do the right thing and the best thing. But I wondered, kind of after the fact, I wonder if my heart was not in the right place and I didn't love the way I was supposed to love or I wasn't loving the way I was supposed to be loving. And maybe there was some pride or ego in there that kept that gift from coming to me that I could share faith. I don't know if that's the way God works, but I do know love is the most important thing, more important than all the spiritual gifts. And if you want the gifts, you've got to have love to start with. Like love is essentially the jar that the spiritual gifts are able to go into. If you don't have love, they're not coming. So we start with love, and then we get the gifts after. 